Hey everyone and welcome back to another news roundup. We have a lot of things. Lies, right. Have lies happened? Well, when a company says that something is impossible after reviewing the whole situation uh, and then it turns out it, it actually is possible and by accident, you've got to wonder. And that's especially so when it's about consumer friendly things like next gen upgrades that, you know, didn't screw over old customers, right? So that's definitely something that's a bit weird. And on that, it seems like 505 are somewhat losing control of the situation. Then next up, Apple's new guidelines are pretty much a direct shot at Microsoft and Google. They're really quite funny. They're essentially unworkable to the point where the level of awkwardness is uh, very, very funny indeed. Then in console land, the series S and X have yet more information and Sony are preparing themselves to respond. But that's not the biggest story because the biggest story is probably that Nvidia have just finalized the biggest chip deal ever at a whopping $40 billion one that I think will have massive implications over the next 10 years, and that is right after NVIDIA pretty much just, well, became top of every news story whenever they release their latest, or at least the specs and stuff of their latest generation of graphics cards. So that's what we're doing today. Of course, we do many things on many days in this channel, and if you want to be a part of that, hit that sub button, because there truly is a lot of news. And speaking of that, let's get started. Well, the publisher of Control, 505 Games, has found themselves in a little bit of hot water. Having previously asserted that it was not possible to offer free next-gen upgrades for versions of Control, apart from the newly released Ultimate Edition, uh, well, s turns out 505 managed to do just that and by accident. And yes, what this actually means is that some PS5 users logged in, and these were people who owned the deluxe edition of the game, or just the base game with the DLC, they reported seeing a download option rather than a purchase option when they visited the Ultimate Edition's PlayStation Network page. And of course, it's the Ultimate Edition that is the only edition of that game that gets you the next-gen upgrade. Now, those affected probably assumed that they had just been upgraded, right, to the Ultimate Edition because they technically owned all of the content that was included in the Ultimate Edition. But it turns out that was not to be. And thankfully, you know, for things like justice and correctness, 505 quickly rectified the mistake so they don't have their Ultimate Editions. Now, remember here, the Ultimate Edition is uh, the only place where you get the next-gen upgrade. Now, if you bought the base game and the Season Pass, which is the same amount of content as the Ultimate Edition, you'd be left out, and you'd have to rebuy if you wanted it next-gen. Now, why is this galling people? Well, 505 Games repeatedly said, repeatedly, that there were certain blockers right? Blockers inhibiting their ability to offer free next-gen upgrades for Control. What were these blockers? I mean, it's a bit weird because now many people are claiming that that was just a lie, right? Because obviously the free upgrades were not impossible because they literally did happen in a limited capacity for some people on the PS Store. So is this situation fair, right? Is it fair to say that they lied? Well, it is the case that Control is a game spanning multiple different versions and levels of content and DLCs and that upgrading everyone to the upgraded, uh, you know, the Ultimate Edition, technically, that would be giving away a lot of free DLC, because what if you didn't purchase the Constituent DLC and then got the up, uh, you know, the Ultimate Edition so that you could get the next-gen upgrade? That probably is something you should have to pay for. In fact, it definitely is. So it seems like, right, Ultimate is basically the only SKU that they published or plan to publish in the next generation, which is a bit of a weak excuse, really, because honestly, it's, it's just lazy. They could have done the work to make that available in all of their different editions. And if this stuff is the case, I mean, just make it free for any like person who has the season pass or people who bought the DLC separately. Give them a free upgrade. Why is that not happening? And perhaps offer the Ultimate Edition at a discounted rate to people who already own the game or perhaps own the DLC. By the way, we've been doing this in Steam for a long bloody time. Why not 505? Now, this mix-up was pretty much uh, seemingly 505 trying trying to navigate some of the messiness here and just have one skew that they would be publishing to the next gen, but it probably would have just been smarter to have, you know, just done something reasonable and given everyone 
a next-gen upgrade. I don't really know why that wouldn't be possible. And certainly, I mean, they, they could have then just sold those DLCs on the next-gen anyway. I mean, what's going on? It seems like a bit of a weak situation, and hopefully a wake-up call to 505, who should work out a better situation here. Next up, NVIDIA. This is big, right? NVIDIA have acquired ARM for $40 billion. Now, interestingly, SoftBank purchased ARM in 2016 for $32 billion, so that's a pretty quick turnaround and a speedy $8 billion for SoftBank. Now, ARM is not like uh, Intel or AMD in that they, you know, instead of doing a complicated instruction set uh, parts, they do a RISC, R-I-S-C parts, reduced instruction set. And that means that do you find ARM, or yeah, do you find ARM things on desktop computers? No. Do you find them in just about every mobile phone, the Nintendo Switch, smart televisions, things like that? Yes. That's where you find ARM chips. You probably own multiple of them. Now, ARM chips are low power consumption and are highly efficient. And a lot of this is because they run a RISC, which stands for Reduced Instruction Set. Now, that's basically leaner than something like the x86 instruction set that your Intel or AMD chips use. And that has big implications for, like, say, power to energy consumption or heat output ratios, as an example. And I mean power there in terms of, like, uh, you know, computing power, right? Horsepower, let's just say. Not that that's really the way you measure that. Anyway, the business model of ARM is a bit different to some of the other companies. They don't do a lot of manufacturing or anything like that. Instead, they're basically just a research and development and licensing uh, operation. So their business model is that they create and license technology and then other groups manufacture. So Apple are a great example where they have a, I believe, a perpetual, one of the highest level um, ARM licenses. Now, Apple are currently in the process of moving to using an ARM architecture for their desktop Macs and, uh, you know, like their laptops and stuff. And that's a pretty major move. You see, they do custom design their own chips, and they're essentially world leading in the mobile space when it comes to what they're actually able to do. Yes, you'll find more RAM on a Android device, but uh, you will almost in every case find higher raw performance with Apple's latest SoC, at least for the longest time, like probably the last decade, when it's been the race of the newest Snapdragon uh, chip from Qualcomm versus the newest Apple chip, Apple's almost always won in just about every way. Now, that has ended up being a situation where the iPad Pro has got an insane horsepower for its wattage. That is a 2018 tablet that geek benches in and around in multi-core an i5 9400K and 9600K, all while being passively cooled and using a lot less power. So the top end of Apple actually moving over to RISC and using that for their desktop computers, that's all pretty interesting. And then that makes you think about NVIDIA's interest here. I think it does make complete sense. I mean, you've got some of the higher end of ARM being explored now, but you also have ARM having an incredible library of intellectual property. That's a lot of licensing revenue and also world-class research and development talent. And really, it's big. Like, this is the biggest deal of its kind in the chip industry. Now, there are some worries. As an example, competition, right? NVIDIA and Apple do not get along. That doesn't really matter, though. Apple have got that perpetual license. Can't really be broken, so that's not going to be much of a problem, I would say. Then also... I mean, ARM-reliant companies may be competing with NVIDIA, right? And that is another sort of competition sort of worry there. Now, NVIDIA themselves have promised neutrality and how they're going to handle all of this. And I would believe them because if they were not practicing neutrality, then I think it could go quite badly for them. Either way, though, this seems like a solid deal. Now, what's actually going to happen when Apple start running their own desktop ARM silicon, right? When they're in a situation where you've got that, but it's actively cooled. It's got a 100 watt TDP. Will the incredible, you know, per amount of power that it's using iPad Pro performance actually scale up into the higher end? And if that is the case, will we see more interest in risk for desktop applications? Maybe NVIDIA see that and they want to position themselves in a way to capitalize on those sorts of things. Also, it would probably help NVIDIA out if they were to dive into projects like, say, Tegra again, right? Uh, you know, like I think it's the Tegra X1 and X2. I think it's the X1 that's powering the Nintendo Switch at the minute. So there's a lot of interesting things there. Overall, you're not going to see much from this deal in the short term. But believe me, in the 10 to 20 year time span, I think this one is going to be absolutely massive. And I suppose, speaking tangentially of Apple, let's talk about them being really awkward for a bit. So, Apple have issued revised App Store guidelines that could potentially open the store up to streaming on iOS, which would be great if you have an iPad and maybe Game Pass, but the caveats are very funny. So, the guidelines previously blocked services like xCloud and Stadia, and that sucked. 
right? And also Steam streaming. Now, seriously, right? Firing up xCloud uh, and having a decent gaming experience on your iPad on the go would be great. Maybe you could get an iPad mini and get clip on, you know, sort of Nintendo Switch style controllers, and that'd be great for some games. It would be a good experience, and I think it would be good business for everyone involved. That's the dream. Will it happen? Almost certainly no, because the new requirements allow game streaming, but provided that each individual game is offered as a standalone app. So if you're doing game streaming for all of xCloud, that, or, you know, for all of the xCloud library of Game Pass games, then every single Game Pass game would have to be reviewed and submitted and all that stuff to Apple, which would probably suck for Microsoft. Now, for Microsoft, who are set to launch xCloud on Android later this week, this would basically mean that they could offer a xCloud catalog app, right? And that would detail all the games available for stream but, well, you know, it's an app that would then just be linking to each individual game's store page. And as a user, that would suck. Uh, Stadia and xCloud would um, then also have to let users sign in with their Apple ID. And of course, customers uh, would have to have the option to pay for their subscriptions via an in-app purchase, where of course, Apple could generate their delicious 30% cut. Unsurprisingly, Microsoft are not particularly thrilled about this. They state that Apple's new conditions remain a, quote, bad experience for customers and yes, Microsoft are right here. I mean, who wouldn't want to install hundreds of separate apps just to do cloud gaming? Not many people. Uh, now, Apple, you know, it's a thing. They do care deeply about gaming, right? where it can be brought into the fold, and they can maximize the hell out of it. Games are a massive portion of their business, but Apple are still Apple. They're going to do it the Apple way, and if you don't want to get on the program, then get out. That's how they roll. And that does mean that streaming games, you know, they'd have to come in in a way where Apple could probably get the 30%, uh, in a way where that at least would be an option, and also where all those games are separate apps so they can hook into the privacy features and, you know, things like screen time and stuff like that. Now, I would say this is obviously a play for streaming happening on iOS, but where Apple have a lot of control over it. It's probably one where they're just designing it to be, you know, for Microsoft, it's like, look, this is going to be on our terms, and that is it. We don't care. Now, it is a bit weird because from a user perspective, you know, if you take, well, like, or, well, I'd say from a tech perspective, take Netflix. Each show is just not a separate app. It's just streaming video. What is xCloud? xCloud is just streaming video. Any tech-oriented person knows that to be the case, but Apple are thinking about this from an uneducated user's sort of perspective, and for them, a game is an app, and that's just how it's got to be. It sucks. The policy sucks, and it's pretty sad. Apple have been surprisingly good for, like, some gaming things, like modern gaming controllers these days, and, you know, Apple Arcade pretty much having, you know, premium games without the microtransactions, and Apple even using that in their marketing for that, they actually seemed a bit clued in, you know, or at least they risked seeming clued into gaming. I mean, I was able to fire up Dead Cells, okay, and play that at, I think, above 1440p on my iPad Pro at 100 hertz. Uh, using like using a gamepad. You know what that was? It was a great gaming experience. It was like nearly perfect. And while streaming will never be as good as running on local hardware, yeah, what is the iPad? It's pretty fast. It works well with controllers, much to my surprise, and it's got a great screen. So it'll be a perfect home for something like xCloud. And it's really sad that Apple's trademark awkwardness and need to control everything will prevent people from enjoying that. So there you go. Apple's new conditions are slightly more friendly in the face of things, but it doesn't particularly matter that much because they're still highly annoying, I would say, both for customers and also the companies that could be potential partners with them when it comes to game streaming. This is probably something that could have expanded gaming on iOS massively, but I think Apple are just cutting themselves off from that, almost certainly because, well... Their main play is to get their cut from free-to-play games and, uh, you know, the microtransactions there and to grow Apple Arcade. And with Apple Arcade, I'm pretty sure that's something they will try to bring into a recurring revenue bundle, probably including TV, music, arcade news, potentially more. At the end of the day, what drives up your stock these days? It's recurring revenue bundles, it's service revenue. Things like Amazon Prime are really good high margin activities. Well, not Amazon Prime, okay. Amazon Prime is something where Amazon kind of lose money there to grow and that's basically the trademark of Amazon. They've continually said, hey investors, profitability doesn't matter. We're capturing more market segments. But fundamentally, something like a recurring revenue bundle is a pretty high margin thing that you can do once you actually grow it. 
And that's, that's what they want to do. That's why Microsoft are spending so much money to move so much of their business over to be a recurring revenue bundle. And I think right now, that's what Apple really cares about. It's that and it's free to play revenue. And guess what? Inviting xCloud over probably just doesn't really mesh with that plan in a way where they feel like they should lift a finger to do anything to sort of grease the wheels and make it happen. Next up, we've got Microsoft responding to criticism. So the Series S has got a 512 gig hard drive. And if you have maybe played Call of Duty Warzone, well, you'll know that 512 gigs really doesn't take you that far. Now, Microsoft have responded to criticisms over the very small uh, hard drive, well, salt say drive, by basically just saying that 512 gigs is what they chose because it's what they needed to do to balance performance and cost. And we can all understand that, but right now there's a rumor that a proprietary one terabyte Seagate expansion will cost $220, which would make the Series S cost similar to the Series X. And this is uh, something that's actually more of a problem than you think, and it really does make you think about the poor man's shoes problem, where it's like, if you can't put the money into getting a decent pair of shoes, you'll spend more money overall by just buying loads of pairs of shoes that are not that useful. So this is basically the price trap problem, right? If you get a Series S, what's going to happen? Well, you're not going to have as much storage, so you're probably going to want to upgrade that storage. And as we've seen, this Seagate expansion is really quite expensive. Now then, there's another problem. No physical games. Physical games generally do get cheaper over time, unlike high-margin digital games, where, of course, the Microsoft Store has got complete control over pricing. So, overall, will your cost of ownership of a Series S actually be more than a Series X? Again, it's the poor man's shoes problem. There's also the USB 3.1 problem, which is uh, not really as nifty of a, a, a thing. Uh, so, the USB 3.1 problem is basically that you can use, like, even fast USB 3.1 drives, but only last-gen games are going to run from them. Why is that? Well, it's the Xbox Velocity architecture. That is the special custom hardware that makes all of the very, very nice, you know, like near instant load times and stuff happen, right? Where, you know, it can just dump the contents of that proprietary internal SSD into system memory ludicrously fastly as compared to what, you know, you can do with your PCIe card, uh, you know, if even if you have like PCIe um, SSDs on your home computer, right? It's really cool cool stuff that both Sony and Microsoft are actually doing, but it really does seem like they're not willing to have an option where you can just plug in, you know, a one terabyte drive off Amazon, just a regular USB 3.1, and uh, play those games, which I think is unfortunate. It would have been good if those next-gen games could run on an Xbox Velocity architecture uh, storage medium, or just run on a regular one and have load times. I think people would be happy to make that trade-off. So it's a bit weird, and it has actually started some debate on if the Series S is even a significant upgrade to the existing Xbox One X. I mean, is it really? And it's pretty simple. The Series S has less raw horsepower than the Xbox One X, right? It's got less RAM, and yes, in terms of teraflops, the GPU is a bit less powerful, but also teraflops don't really matter, and the new GPU of the Series S is, of course, on a newer architecture. So overall, I'm just left thinking, what is the lifetime cost of ownership going to be like? And also, will the Series S offer a great gameplay experience for years to come? Or will it be a situation where in five years, your games are at 30 FPS again and you're sad? I'm actually pretty cynical, and I think it probably will be that. And of course, it wouldn't be a video if Sony didn't have some problems as well, because they are reportedly experiencing production issues on the PS5 SoC. SoC, by the way, stands for System on a Chip. Now, Sony are expected to ship 11 million consoles by March 2021. That's bad news, though, because it is down from the 15 million that they actually ordered this summer, and uh, that's when Sony actually boosted orders in anticipation of increased demand. Now, that demand is still something I think they do expect, but uh, it's, you know, it's for other production-related reasons, and apparently both Sony and Microsoft are facing component scarcity, and many analysts are actually unconvinced the duo will be able to fully meet demand. Some analysts are even expecting launch delays, which would really surprise me, um, but that's what's going on, and Daniel Ahmad actually also does expect supply issues, but believes that uh, both companies are willing to eat the increased cost of rolling with more expensive error, like express shipments, to actually hit the demand. My analysis here is pretty simple. 
I think demand's going to be massive. I think that gaming time has massively increased this year, and especially something like the digital editions, or digital-only editions of both of the new consoles will be a really, like, attractive sort of value option for people. I also think that COVID has accelerated the usefulness of games, whether you're someone who's bored or you're a parent who's like, wow, you know, my kids can't go outside or do stuff with their friends. We really need a gaming console because it turns out their classroom banter is now happening in Fortnite. It's a bit depressing, is it? I don't know. Maybe I'm just uh, somehow old at my age, whatever. But I think the like desire-based demand, maybe even some need-based demand for uh, good gaming consoles, I think that's going to increase. But then the question is, will the economic downturn that will likely happen wipe that out? And that's where I'd say that, well, middle-class households are probably, you know, they typically have jobs that are more, uh, you know, work-at-home friendly. Like, I've seen stats that it's pretty staggering there. Uh, so they are probably the target market for such project uh, products, so I do think the demand will still be large. But that said, uh, yeah, there, there's definitely going to be a lot of people, and it's the sad fact of uh, where things are going right now, who are just going to be in a big financial pinch, and I have to wonder what that's going to do with, uh, you know, new waves of, of consoles, which certainly are what you'd call a luxury good. The next up, there's also set to be this Wednesday a PlayStation event. They are promising updates on first and third party devs, and it's going to be a 40 minute show that will show some launch and beyond games. Of course, though, what do people want? They want pricing info, so hopefully they will get that. Undoubtedly, though, I think Sony do have the game advantage on Microsoft. Even right now they do, and if they were to have some sort of, you know, and one more thing, hey, two years down the line, God of War 2 sequel. Even though everyone could have predicted that, if they just announced announce that and get the hype, I think it would be massive for their business and uh, just for interest in the PS5. And ultimately, that's the thing they've got to double down on because it's the one thing that Microsoft cannot beat them on right now. Next up, we've got good news from Facebook, which I hate to have to say because, of course, Facebook purchased Oculus and apparently the Oculus Quest 2 reveal is going to be this Wednesday. And the blueprints have already leaked. You've got almost a 4K screen, a 50% increase in pixels, over the original and a Snapdragon XR2 chipset that supposedly doubles the CPU and GPU performance over the Snapdragon 835. So you've got that along with 6 gigs of RAM and an optional 256 gig storage. There's no price yet, but probably 400 bucks if the first one is to go by. And you know what? The Quest 1 is basically my one of my favorite devices these days. You know, getting to do some Beat Saber during lockdown to get the fitness going. It's been great. And as much as giving Facebook money absolutely sucks, probably going to do it for the quest too. And next up, we've got EA. So, Origin. EA Origin is dead as a brand. It's now called the EA Desktop App. And their intent there is to create a, as they say, more frictionless, fast, and socially oriented experience for our players. Which apparently means that the new app is going to feature fewer clicks to navigate, background downloads, UI updates, and a better patching experience, which all does seem good enough, and it does tie into EA's wider efforts to be a bit more reasonable. You know, they're returning to Steam, they've got EA Play joining Game Pass, things like that. And uh, you know what? Is the EA desktop app really, really boring and not that good of a name? Yes. Is it better than pretentious wank like EA Origin? Yes. And with that, I am done for today's show. So, hope you enjoyed it. Of course, if you did, you can check out lots of cool physical goodies that we will, uh, well, no, we won't deposit them in your mailbox. The postal service as well. Um, but you can do that and also subscribe because there's going to be a lot of content coming out on the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.